Welcome back to Forward CloudSec. This is Human versus Robot, why you should automate your vulnerability management program with Kazia and Katia. Before we start, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, especially our gold sponsor, Datadog. Datadog is a full stack observability, metrics, and monitoring platform. I'd also like to just provide a friendly reminder that linked in our Slack channel, we have a uh, feedback form to fill out at the end of the conference. Your feedback is very important to us so that we know how we can continue to serve you, the community, because that's what we're here for. For those in the room, please silence your cell phones and use the mic to ask questions. For remote attendees, we'll be looking for questions on Slack and Twitter. Please welcome Kazia and Katya. going to be talking about building a vulnerability management system that's primarily focused on engineering rather than human operational work. So we did submit this under the title Human versus Robot, um, but a week ago we came up with a much superior title, Sisyphus and the CVE Feed. I'm not, if you're not familiar with the myth of Sisyphus, um, it's a mortal punished by the gods to essentially push a boulder up a hill for eternity. But every time the boulder hits the top of the hill, it rolls all the way back down, and the cycle continues. So as uh, security professionals, I'm sure that may resonate with you. <laughs> um, all right, quick intros. My name's Kazia. I'm a senior software engineer at Airbnb. Um, fun fact again about me, if you want to hear me talk um, or ramble for 20 minutes, just ask me about e-bikes and public transit. <laughs> 20 minutes minimum for sure. Um, yeah, and I'm Katya Marshall, engineering manager at Airbnb. And my fun fact is I recently had to take care of my friend's son, who's five years old. I didn't know how to entertain him, so I taught him how to pick locks. And when his parents picked him up, he asked for a lockpick set. <laughs> they were not amused, but I was. So I thought I would share that with you all. So before we talk about how we automated our vulnerability management program, let's talk about the VM fundamentals first. So we all know that there is no software out there that is free of vulnerabilities. Great for us, job security. But it's even more important to design and implement the process that addresses each step of a vulnerability lifecycle. So this is the traditional vulnerability management lifecycle. You detect the vulnerability. You have various sources. This can be um, CVE alerts, pen tests, bug bounty, Twitter, you name it. And then it's followed by the risk assessment, where you try to understand the exploitability, the risk, and how it applies to your environment. And it's followed by the step that is very traditional in VM, which is reporting and metrics, which is good to show known attack surface, but there's obviously more that needs to be done. And what we will be focusing on is remediation and prevention, because as you all know, um, it's key to understand the root cause instead of just catching up and playing guacamole. So what are our objectives? Um, we are a cloud-based company um, at Airbnb, and we try to scale as much as possible, and obviously that means every time you introduce more assets, they come with their vulnerabilities. So we needed to build a solution where we can easily scale. We also wanted to ensure that we quickly detect vulnerabilities, but we also address them in a timely manner. Um, also, we focus on prioritization. You all know when you have the constant vulnerability streams, how do you ensure that you prioritize the highest risk in your environment? Because there's no way that you can 100% prioritize all of the vulnerabilities at the same le level. And um, my favorite point here on the slide is understanding the root cause, the patterns that you constantly, that constantly contribute to these vulnerabilities and causing them. And one thing that we wanted to do is build something that makes us vendor agnostic, because we wanted to be able, regardless of the vendor limitations, to expand on that pipeline. We had many challenges. Um, but the top three that we would like to share with you today is a struggle to find the accurate severity scoring. Um, most of the times, the severity can be inflated, or the security advisory is vague and not helpful, um, or the vulnerability requires internal context. Um, or the vulnerability is just difficult to exploit, and Kazea had a great joke the other yeah, day. Like, let's be real, CVE feed will say something that's a critical, but it requires uh, local access to user interaction and the stars aligning in the UMPs before it can be exploited. <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously most of the security advisories are incredibly vague, and that made it challenging for us to assess the risk that is uh, relevant to us. And 
Yeah, and obviously operational work. Every time you have multiple vulnerability streams, different vendors, different solutions, different reports, how do you ensure that you focus on the risk versus the noise? And that obviously introduces manual triage because you will need a human behind the scene to actually look at these ones. And accountability is also a challenge that we had. How do you make sure that teams actually fix it? And how do you keep them responsible but also engaged? Um, so you shouldn't be hating you. Yeah. So, yeah, let's go there. Um, so with that in mind, our team tries to stick to a general guideline of the approaches we prioritize while working on this. They're not set in stone, and we don't always accomplish them right away, but it's kind of our north star. So our biggest goal is to create a system that does not rely on human intervention to triage risk. It can be tempting to want to get 100% of everything by manually reviewing every potential alert to see if it's applicable to your environment. Um, but this is a misconception. Um, you might feel more in control, but humans aren't going to catch 100% of things either. There's alert fatigue, people can misread things, and on the other hand, the cons associated with a system like this are significantly worse. Uh, validating every alert will not scale as your company grows. Uh, it slows down the time from detection to remediation, leaving the vulnerability in your environment for longer. And too many false positives lower trust in the security team. Um, not to mention, half the time, the more, more severe vulns are dropped on Twitter from someone with like an anime profile pic and not our scanners. <laughs> Uh, so instead, uh, it's better to make the goal the minimization of false positives, so we reduce the time we spend triaging the relevance of vulnerabilities. Uh, we have things to do. I don't want to be reading every single alert that comes from our scanner. I have my fourth campaign of Fire Emblem to get to. <laughs> uh, so the fact of the matter is, there is no human or automated process that will ever catch 100% of vulnerabilities. You need to accept the existential dread that comes with this and build it to the foundation of your solution rather than fight against it. The boulder will never stay on top of the hill. Yep, exactly. So to Kazia's point, it's impossible to address 100% of your vulnerabilities. So with that foundation in mind, how are we supposed to handle potential misses? Um, one thing that we try to focus on is pairing detection with preventative measures, um, making sure that we, block, that we block vulnerabilities from being introduced in the first place. Um, so, especially because sometimes you don't even know whether the vulnerability has been disclosed. So the way we try to accomplish this is obviously pairing detection with preventative measures. Some examples here is um, patch cadence, which we all know, I think patch Tuesday, I don't know if it's still a thing, but yeah, that's something that companies tend to do. Um, also, one thing that worked well for us were frequent image deploys. It doesn't matter whether you're containers or EC2s, et cetera. We try to focus on frequent image deploys um, regardless of the vulnerability report. So just make it harder to introduce vulnerabilities in the first place. And also the easy road should be the secure road for our engineers. We also can't neglect the relationships part of this. All the automation in the world won't be useful if you antagonize other engineering teams with like floods of inapplicable alerts. Uh, we want to balance security with developer productivity. Uh, Trade-offs are important. We don't want to sacrifice the effectiveness of our engineering team for low-priority security requests. Within reason, of course, there are obviously things we can never compromise on. It can also help to get buy-in by pairing security benefits with other engineering goals. For instance, let's say you have a team that doesn't want to maintain old versions of their internal tool. Um, you can work with them to get a patching cadence done so that it's fixing vulns in our environment and it reduces the number of versions they have to maintain. Uh, we've made the mistake in the past of being too top-down, but that's never been as effective as when we've treated engineering teams as our partners and sought their input. Um, and make it a mutually beneficial process. Um, yeah, so again, one of the challenges was accountability. We really want to encourage you to um, always find a programmatic way to find um, service owners, remediation owners, but most importantly, introduce an SLA process to ex to just set expectations on when the vulnerability should be remediated. It's also um, key to have an SLA extension process. I know we are all in security, we think everything needs to be fixed um, as soon as possible, while I agree, but it's important also to be flexible in case if you have mitigations in place that could reduce the risk. Also, one thing that I want to highlight, um, you should also leverage metrics, not necessarily to finger point and show individuals how badly they're doing, but also to leverage ways to show leadership that gaps exist and you need to focus resourcing on certain gaps in your environment. So with all that in mind, let's get to the actual implementation of what we built. 
All right, so the first step in our workflow is to aggregate and process our vulnerabilities. Um, we try to be vendor agnostic, agnostic. Depending on your setup, you may have any number of scanners deployed. They could have different formats, different levels of information provided. So instead of just using a scanner out of the box with its default reporting tools and having maybe multiple that have no ex um, knowledge of the existence of each other, we import it, standardize the data, and then we track every unique vulnerability with a UUID um, to track it through the vulnerability lifecycle. Our general thought is that our UUID should represent a vulnerability and the asset it was found in. And there's ways to simplify this. For instance, you may wanna just uh, make a UUID based on an asset and then the pa vulnerable package version. Because a package version can have any number of CVEs. It's not as useful to track every single one because just updating the package will fix all of them. As I mentioned earlier, contextualizing the risk in the VM space can be incredibly challenging. So how did we solve it? Um, first of all, we collect asset information from multiple sources. So we um, try to understand whether the asset is externally facing, whether it's in a sandbox account, does it carry PII? Um, any metadata that you can collect uh, from, about the asset, regardless of from which vendor, you just try to collect this information. We then combine it with the attack type, so we all are familiar with CVSS scores, course, environmental, environmental scores. We try to understand how can you actually exploit the vulnerability. Um, does it require user interaction? Is it network versus local? All of these specifics do make a difference as you contextualize the risk. So we combine this data. We also leverage external scoring. We don't rely on NVD only. We try to get um, CVS has scores or scoring from um, vendors that we use to balance and get a higher signal of the actual risk versus relying on NVD default scoring alone. So the more metadata you have, the better signal you will get about uh, the risk. And yeah, so a, an example here on how you can imagine this is Let's imagine you have an asset in a sandbox account and you run a scan, but the scan tells you it's a critical vulnerability and you need to drop everything and fix it, but it's actually an asset that is in a sandbox account, isolated, no one really has access to it. Do you really have to handle it as a critical vulnerability? Probably not. You probably will have bigger fires in, in your environment. So this contextualizing the risk helped us to get a better signal of the risk. Um, next, reporting and remediation. Uh, so now all that information can be passed into our reporting service, which I'll go into significantly more detail on later slide. Uh, the reporting service doesn't need to care about the scanner source or the vulnerability type. All it needs to know is the UUID in order to create tickets, track metrics, track fixes. And then once uh, an owner closes it as fixed, now we want to programmatically verify it's no longer in our systems. Um, humans make mistakes. We want to trust but also verify. Uh, so here's where we can use the UUID again. Uh, some scanners will output state once a day or once every, like, periodically. So if your scanner is no longer outputting that UUID, you can conclude that that ticket is safe to be, um, is, um, is now safe. Um, or you can write your, use your own internal infrastructure data, uh, writing code determining if something is fixed, and then just pass that into the reporting service. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we're a cloud-based company. How do we easily scale, integrate with multiple vulnerability sources as we grow? So these are the top four implementations that helped us to automate this process. First of all, we leverage vendor APIs. We try to not rely on the vendor standard reporting. Instead, we leverage the API to extract the data that is relevant to us. Um, also, we leverage Apache Airflow. If you're not familiar with Apache Airflow, it's an open source data management platform that helps you deal with large data sets of, um, especially vulnerability streams can be enormous. So it, then after extracting this information and process it, we store it in Hive, Presto, uh, which allows us to apply a standard format to it and just even further to contextualize the risk uh, based on this data and, um, and make it available for other steps of the process. And then we also um, still have to integrate with Jira. In this case, we leverage the API and make sure that we programmatically create tickets only if necessary, because obviously we want to move away from the ticketing process. And while we wanted to note our specific implementation, um, it's worth noting that you can do this in many ways with your own tooling and system. Um, this is not like limited to using specific types of technology stacks. Um, all right, let me go a bit more into the reporting service. Um, so 
uh, client writes codes to standardize the vulns and calculate the risk. Then all they have to do is pass it into the reporting service and it handles all the heavy lifting for them. Um, there's no need to keep reinventing the wheel. Uh, this unifies shared logic like ticket creation, finding the asset owner, um, tracking metrics. Um, you can also, it also handles things like deduplication. So if you have a scanner that could potentially report, or you have multiple scanners that could potentially report on the same CVE, um, or if the client is worried about accidentally reporting something more than once, um, that's all handled in the reporting service. It keeps track of the vulnerability status and won't like recreate tickets for vulnerabilities that we already know about. So this makes it really easy to scale with any number of additional vulnerabilities you want to start tracking. The functionality is modular. Anyone can write the code interesting new results from either a typical scanner or even your own non-traditional security tools. Um, just chain it into the reporting service and it's handled, like the rest of it's handled. This made our process much more efficient. We don't have to be the blocker for tracking every type of vulnerability. And um, we also don't have to own every scanner in existence. We just have to maintain the reporting service. So after this was deployed, multiple security teams were now enabled to like, deploy their own scanners and start using it without being dependent on us. Yeah, we also had multiple um, engineering teams integrate with our reporting service, uh, which was also helpful. Anyway, so quickly about the results. Now that we've told you what we did, um, I promise you we did not make this chart up. We are just not allowed to, it's also not a Bitcoin chart, but it's, it's just uh, our, our <laughs> So our legal team wouldn't allow us to share the actual number, but we just wanted to show you how contextualizing the risk allowed us to drive down the false positive rate, instead again of looking at the noise and just uh, moving away from the actual risk. Um, this also helped us um, really re uh, respond quickly when log for shell um, dropped. Um, all right, so log for shell dropped, and then we were able to quickly write code, um, tracking every Java service that would potentially need to be patched. We then just plugged that into our reporting service, which pulled the list and created tickets and found service owners for the relevant services, that, along with remediation action items. Um, since the, um, the severity was obviously high, um, there was a quick turnaround SLA for service owners to deploy the patch. And then simultaneously, um, I was able to write code um, cross-referencing the fixed tickets with deployment data to see if they, act, all, they actually did correctly deploy the patch. So then if someone had made a mistake, we could reopen the tick then and let them know that something went wrong and they would have to redo it. And so we were able to confidently report to leadership our risk status at, at any point of the process. So final thoughts, why are we here? What do we want you to take away from this presentation? First of all, try to leverage vendor APIs more and more instead of relying out of the box deployment. Um, unify one central uh, source instead of having multiple scanner reports uh, staggered all over the place. Also, ingesting the data into one centralized system in your own environment will allow you to create a standard format and also customize the data based on your needs. Also, try to move away, I mean, not try, but look at your environment and see whether there are um, solutions that you can leverage for your automation. For instance, we mentioned Apache Airflow, not a typical security solution, but was able to contribute to our automation. Or we also leverage OS Query. It's not a VM solution, but it helps us collect metadata. Um, also, most vendors require invasive access for improved risk assessment, so instead of expanding your attack surface, see what type of tools can be integrated in your, tool, in your process. And again, focus on contextualizing the risk uh, because internal metadata can help you tweak the vulnerability risk rating. And, um, and one of my favorite points, and actually the reason why I'm here, um, stop relying on traditional vulnerability management where it's just about um, metrics, tracking things, um, having TPMs, chase owners. All of this is not really scalable. Make vulnerability management an engineering problem in order to scale and reduce risk. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, obviously, this is a lightning talk, and we could not go into as much detail as we would have loved. Um, but we're actually going to be releasing a blog post um, in the next few weeks if you're interested in hearing in significant more detail. Um, yeah, and also want to... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just want to give a person um, 
back in San Francisco has helped uh, implement some of this um, from a TPM perspective. Diana has helped build this program as well. So obviously there were many people behind this automation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, some very good questions we had coming in. Uh, so my first question to you is how do you implement some sort of risk acceptance of a, I know that this has a CVE and it's vulnerable, but it's okay in this context. So you don't keep getting it as a false positive. And then how do you know when you should stop accepting that risk and revisit the prior decision? Yeah, sure. So we review, so first of all, we give SLA, extens SLA extensions as a process, um, but we also, if it's a critical or high vulnerability, we try to um, manually review with the partnering teams whether it's acceptable, but we also don't, um, we constantly review this process. We have, depending on the severity, we review the frequency of the SLA extension, and we also have a deadline on how long the SLA extension uh, is allowed to be um, requested for. Yeah, we do have a process for people to like take the reported vulnerability and explain if they're mitigations or why it doesn't actually um, yeah. apply. So yeah, we, yeah. No mitigation, no extension. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, next, how automated is the risk contextualization? Because you kind of drew a pretty diagram, but I think for a lot of us, that's one of the hardest challenges. Right. Like how have you automated the metadata collection? Yeah, you want to, yeah. Like how manual is it or human is it to get that final risk score? Um, so that's actually all automated. So we, um, this requires building separate things of like pulling in our assets, um, like tracking, you know, for example, services. Um, and then we store program, like we store in a centralized location, like information about an asset, if it has PII or if it's externally facing. Uh, so it did require wrangling a lot of different information to put in one place. But that is all um, programmatic. The one maybe exception is if we do tend to manually review if something's a critical, um, because that's a lot like more tricky, harder to um, like get 100% right, but in general we find automating this um, is very accurate with highs. And also in the implementation slide that we her, uh, had earlier, this, uh, these are the, uh, the tech stack that we use to, um, to programmatically solve that. Yeah. Um, and then like how do you kind of keep that up to date, both as existing tools and technologies change, uh, and then how do you work with teams as they're building out new features and need to integrate in with this? Um, yeah, so we, yeah, we partner with teams, they reach out, they say um, they're interested and we like to work with them on like what they want to report. Um, also, if a team wants to integrate, we also require them to say what their preventative measures are going to pair with this because we don't want to just create a system that's only looking for detection. We want to hear, okay, what's the future longer term goal to like prevent these um, vulnerabilities from like being in, um, imported in the first time place. What was the first part of that question? I think I missed uh, it. As things change, like let's say I yeah. have a component that doesn't have PII now, yeah. and then in three months I do have PII, mm -hmm. and you need to know that. How, how Do you find you're able to keep that updated? So part of it is that we do um, like require service owners to keep up like, like information about their service. And so for instance, if they remove PII, um, and they start getting tickets, they are m motivated to update their, <laughs> yeah. yeah but and then we also, well, we can't go into a ton of detail, but we have also other um, detection systems to determine if, um, yeah. But also OS query helped us here uh, quite a bit. You can collect so much metadata about the asset. Um, also, we have an, I'm sorry, I'm just constantly thinking about legal. <laughs> but, but yeah, the uh, point here is try to use internal services that give you this data so that you don't have to manually look it up. Um, this can be, for instance, a partnering team in the infrastructure team or an SRE team that has a service that can give you this information or an AWS environment or GCP Azure cloud environment. You can collect this metadata about the asset to help you collect this um, asset context. So we don't do that manually. But yeah, sorry, we ha can't go into an enormous amount of detail because of, yeah, legal reasons, so we're trying to give the best overview we can here. But we do automate a lot of this, most of this metadata uh, collection. Awesome, uh, great talk. Uh, just a question around the different cloud provider resource APIs that you're using. Are you using something general like cloud asset inventory or resource graph API, or are you kind of like slicing and dicing per resource provider and querying the individual resource API? Uh, let's see. I'm not sure how much detail we need. Yeah. We All of the above? With yeah. The, the, yeah. 
<laughs> no, but, it, but again, um, all you need to um, just find the sources that can give you the metadata. Of course, at the beginning, um, we try to run as many queries, but obviously that can be expensive and performance heavy. So we try to make that based on the environment. If it's your production environment, maybe you should run more queries, have more sources. Sandbox account, maybe not as much. So really try to look at all of the sources you have available. And to be clear, this has been a very iterative, iterative process. Like our first like attempt wasn't necessarily like perfect. <laughs> yeah. Or if we've noticed there was some missing metadata, then we did additional engineering work trying to like acquire that to continue. So we like honestly, it's a continuing process. We continue to maintain. We continue to add more and more metadata as is accessible to us. Okay. Uh, final question. Um, aside from open vulnerabilities and SLAs, uh, are there other intermediate metrics you track, such as coverage? Yeah, we do track many other metrics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I promise there will be a blog post with more implementation details. Um, and, and obviously, if the blog post does not address your questions, feel free to reach out at any time. We'll make sure to address them. Um, but yeah. Thank, right, you. Well, thank you so much to uh, Kazia and Kadia. Uh, we will.